<laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Tina. Tina is terrific, by the way. This is this whole program, everything about it is great, and she has also joined the board of Draper University, which is, I'll tell you a little bit about later. But first, I think we need a moment of silence for um, Reg. What's his last name? Presley. Because he wrote, do you know? Wild Thing. Yeah. OK, not silence. Everybody get up and go, Wild oh. Thing! OK, ready? One, two, three, everybody up. Wild, wild Thing! Yes. You make my heart sing. OK. <laughs> he died today. It was a very sad moment for me. Um, Anyway, it's a thrill to be here at the Stanford Thought Leader Program. And what I thought I'd do is, uh, is kind of go through four concepts so that you can kind of get the idea. And uh, the best way to do this, I think, is we start with Tina. And uh, Tina, I want you to give high fives to as many people as you can. As soon, wait, as soon as you get a high five, stand up. Give high fives to as many people as you can and pass high fives all the way until everybody's standing up. Ready? One, two, three, go. Corner. Come on, get that corner. Okay, there we go. Okay, that was good. That was good. Okay, everybody can go sit back down. Okay, that's viral marketing, and that was the idea I came up with when we when we did Hotmail to put a little message at the bottom of everybody's screen to say get your free email at Hotmail. Actually, the original idea was. P.S. I love you. Get your free email at Hotmail. But the founders didn't want to do that. And to this day, I think we would have had a much more loving and peaceful world <laughs> if we had stuck with P.S. I love you. But still, uh, now what are there? Billion and a half people now that have, um, have some form of web-based email. And that was all just, we spread it really quickly through these great guys at Hotmail who uh, made that happen. Um, so the second thing, what happened was viral marketing took off, but then everyone was talking to everyone, and a few people were just getting bombed with spam. And so that's where Zuckerberg came up with that social media and social marketing, so that you could, you could have a sort of a smaller group that you wanted to coordinate with. And we won't do a demonstration of that, but. Um, now I, want to, now I want to talk about something. These, these last two I'm very excited about because these are new concepts and they're really making the world uh, uh, really make all, our lives a lot easier. Um, one is, uh, oh, can I get a ride to the airport later on this afternoon? Anybody here? Anybody? Okay, great. Okay, that's called crowdsourcing. <laughs> Okay, everybody was given this opportunity, but there was somebody who could get me a ride to the airport. Um, and then crowdfunding. Who, who would give one dollar to, uh, to become, to cure lung cancer? I'd give 10. And he'd give 10. <laughs> okay, that's, that's crowdfunding, but hey, that guy up there didn't have his hand up. It's only a dollar. Um, anyway, crowdfunding, I'm going to go into that in some greater depth. But um, those are the four concepts I want you to walk away with. Um, and that's basically what they are. Um, this has been my life. I've spent my life dedicating to supporting heroes. And you notice that some of these are fantastic heroes. I like the idea of superheroes because they build people's imaginations. And, uh, and if you look back at heroes, that's a great thing because you look back and you say, wow, Steve Jobs, what he did, Elon Musk, these guys from Skype, they all had a big impact on society. But, uh, but the guys who might have had an even bigger impact are the guys who, who got people thinking in terms of becoming superheroes. 
because that's where your imagination really flies. Um, now I'm going to do a little pre-roll by this book. My dad wrote it. It's really great. It's about the entrepreneur and the venture capitalist and their relationship. Watch this show. It's my daughter's show. It's a really good show. It's about, you know, she interviews like Ted Turner and gets him to sing Captain Planet with her. And it's a very fun show. It's called The Valley Girl. If you need an incubator, this is my son's incubator. <laughs> Who's funder? Um, this is my, this is my fun. <laughs> uh, Draper Fisher Jurvetson, we've been in business now 27, 28 years. And, uh, and we've funded venture entrepreneurs all over the world. And it turns out, today is a great day because this is the first day I realized that we have funded 1,000 companies. Wow. Whoa. Double five <laughs> and they're all over the world. So I, I started to think about um, the globe and what it could do for us and how, uh, how it would expand when I was actually um, failing in my venture business. Um, we had a little SBIC and it didn't really, wasn't really working out very well. Uh, there was no public market <laughs> like today. And there was a, uh, and I was just struggling along trying to figure out what to do. And um, some guy from Alaska said, oil is now $5 a barrel. You know what a, oil, a, a barrel of oil costs now? It's like a hundred and something, hundred dollars or something. Um, it was five dollars a barrel and they were starting to panic because all of their economy came from oil and they said, we need something else. We need venture capital, entrepreneurship. And, uh, and it got me thinking that you could actually do this in other places. Uh, anyway, a lot of global opportunities. There's global warming, global finance, global communications, global health. Uh, so we started to think, wow, we ought to really think globally. And, um, and part of it was getting a little window. When we funded Hotmail, uh, the founder, Sabir Bhatia, sent an email to his friend in India. And within three weeks, we had 100,000 registered Hotmail users in India. And there weren't even 100,000 computers in India at that time. So it was all of a sudden, we realized we could do commerce all over the world. We could spread uh, information all over the world. A lot of great things were going to happen around the world. And, uh, and so at DFJ, we made this decision to start setting up offices around the world. And we knew that it used to be the Silicon Valley required, when I was an electrical engineer, the Silicon Valley, you had to start your, biz your electronics business in the Silicon Valley because the disk drive manufacturers were here, the, uh, the processors were here, the memory devices were here. Uh, everything was here. So you had to, if you were starting a business, you had to build it here. All the printers were here. Everything was here. But then all of a sudden, there were these companies that didn't require any hardware. So we thought, oh my gosh, those could be done anywhere. You can start a business no matter where you are. You've got the same information now on Google and Baidu and whatever as everybody else in the world. So if you are creative enough, you can start a business that spreads all over the world, and it doesn't have to be here in the Silicon Valley. Anyway, um, so now I'm going to tell you about my travels around the world. Um, first of all, um, I told you a little bit about the Hotmail story, but um, it was two, two guys about 25, 26 years old. They came into my office. They had one idea, and then... Uh, we said, you know, that idea we don't really think is going to fly. And as they were walking out, they said, well, we have this other idea. And we said, well, tell, tell us the other idea. Well, the other idea was this free web-based email. And, you know, as venture capitalists, all we're thinking about, right, is money. Money, 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 right? So, um, so they said free, and it was like, what? It fell on tin ears. But we, we thought, you know, they have a lot of chutzpah, these two. They're going to do something for free. Well, we might as well give it a shot. So we gave them a little bit of money, and um, and the thing uh, was uh, magically appeared. And uh, the reason this is on the India slide is that Sabir Bhatia was Indian, and uh, and it was a uh, it was it, after the after the viral marketing idea, it spread like crazy. 11 million users in 18 months, and uh, as you know, it's it's everywhere. Um, my other story about 
Hotmail, about India was I, we, we eventually set up an office in India. And uh, my partner there, after, after my, my third trip to India, said, OK, are you ready to cross an Indian street? And I'm looking. And OK, there's a, there's a cow coming across. And there's a, a guy with a rickshaw. And then there's a car zipping through and a motorcycle cycle coming this way. And it's like seven roads are all converging on the place I'm supposed to cross. And, the, and, and you know, the baby is crawling across the road. And, <laughs> and, and so I said, OK. And so I get about halfway across. And, uh, and I see an opening. And I run. And my partner goes, no! And I said, what? I got across. And he goes, no sudden movements. <laughs> so what is happening in India is every, everyone is doing partial differential calculus every time they cross the street. <laughs> there are some amazing engineers and, and uh, software talent coming out of that country for that reason. Um, so then. Um, I'm going to tell you this story. This is fun. I, my good friend Tony Perkins said, um, hey, will you be at this conference? Will you speak at this conference? And I said, absolutely. Be happy to do it. And it was here at Stanford. And I said, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, we had our first Skype board meeting in Tallinn, Estonia. And it was the same day. What's a mother to do? So I, I said, Tony, I'm so sorry. I've I've got to go to this thing. Um, I got to go to this board meeting in Tallinn, and um, and I said, but can can maybe we can do it by video conferencing? And at that time, it was like this, and um, and and I said, well, Tony, um, you know, we'll give it a shot, and then let's have a phone for a backup. And he goes, yeah, okay. And at that time, um, Skype was um, was just phone calls, just audio calls. And uh, so I said, Nicholas. Oh, and Tony said, well, can you get that guy Nicholas? And maybe you can do a little Q&A with Nicholas Zenstrom. And I said, great. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I call Nicholas. And he says, yeah, oh, sure, we'll do it. And he said, video conference. Oh, yeah, we've been thinking about something like that in the lab. And I said, yeah, yeah, but we need a video conferencing system for this thing. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we got it wired. So I get there, and I'm setting up, and we're in Tallinn, and, and uh, Tony's on the other end of the phone. And I said, Tony, I think we got this thing going. And, and Tony says, OK, great. And so Nicholas turns to the door, and he goes, throw the switch. And I said, what? And he goes, he goes oh, you know, we were working on this in the, in the back. I think we got a good alpha program going, and we're going we're gonna to do a video conference system. Uh, we're going to run it through our own system. And I thought, oh, great. And uh, so then at the end, I said, Tony, how did that come through? And he goes, it was perfect. Oh, my gosh. We heard you perfectly. We saw you perfectly. How? It was amazing. And I said, I turned to Nicholas, and I said, how did you do that? And he goes, oh, well, we cut off about 300,000 simultaneous phone calls <laughs> so that we could use the bandwidth. <laughs> so if you're in a startup, you'll do anything to make sure the thing works. And so he did. And I apologize if any of you were on a Skype call at that time. Um, OK, and then I'll tell you about my trip to China. The first time I went was about 30 years ago. Um, and I was with my dad, and he was the chairman of the UN Development Program. And so we were kind of on a UN mission. But at that time, we arrived in the airport in Beijing, and we drove in the only car on the only paved road to the only international hotel, as, as defined as bathrooms were the toilet I can recognize. <laughs> um, and, and everybody was there, and they were selling uh, fruit and vegetables and whatever else to each other, and 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 everybody was on bicycles. All everything moved by bicycle, and it was fun and, and fascinating. And so, flash forward about 15 years. It's 1998, 99. When we, um, when I thought I had heard somebody had built a 90 million dollar chocolate company in China, and I said, well, gee, maybe I should go check that out. And so I went this time to Shanghai. And from Shanghai to Hangzhou was about a three-hour drive. So I was driving from, to Hangzhou. 
I'm looking out the window, it's very boring, it's all the same thing. Two-story concrete tilt-ups. Everybody lived in two-story concrete tilt-ups. Then all of a sudden there was one with a spire and a driveway and, a, and beautiful blue windows. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then I, we went a little further and, and there was another one. A spire, driveway, blue windows. Spire, driveway, blue windows. And then I saw three together with the driveways all connected and, and blue windows all the way across. And I thought, whoa, that blue window salesman is going to make a fortune. <laughs> and then the second thing I thought was, oh my gosh, it's just like the 50s here where it was keeping up with the Joneses. If Jones had a refrigerator, you had to have a refrigerator. If he had an oven, you had to have an oven. If he had a cell phone, you had a <laughs> Well, the cell phone came later. Um, so I thought, wow, this is a really interesting opportunity. And so I met with a big, some, some big finance minister in China, and I said, um, he said, uh, hi, we want you to invest all your money in China. And, and I said, oh, I never invest in China. And I was a little bit trying to provoke him. And he said, well, why not? He said, because this guy who built the $90 million chocolate company here got nationalized. You guys just took it from him. If you want people to invest here, they have to make a lot of money, and they have to um, be able to repatriate that money, bring it back to their country. And if, you, if they see one or two people making a lot of money by repatriating, it, it'll be Katie bar the door. People will be lining up to invest in China. And, uh, and I, I couldn't tell whether the translator had said it right or anything, and whether he, and he kind of nodded, but I wasn't quite sure. But I think he was really listening, because somehow that's exactly what ended up happening. And a lot of money went into China. Um, and we, we started to make investments in China. And our first ones, we thought, we thought, oh, we're going to China. Well, it's a new country. And, we, and so we started giving money to people, and really, literally, this was giving money, to people who, investing, to people who said, I have great government connections. <laughs> OK, you guys would have known. We lost all our money in all those companies. But we started to think, well, what, what, about, what do we normally do? Well, we invest in these driven, dynamic, interesting entrepreneurs who make great things happen. And, and uh, so we started to do that, and just with small, small amounts of money. And from there, we got Baidu, which is the search engine for China, and Focus Media, which is like the clear channel for China, and, uh, and YiPay, which is like the PayPal for China. Uh, and and we, we had sort of an open field, and we had gr quite a run of it. The um, reason I put Singapore up here is this is the model government. You look at that skyline, and you know that that government has let builders go. He has, they have let people do pretty much what they wanted, and they have built a spectacular skyline. My daughter came to Singapore, and uh, she said, wow, it's just like the Jetsons. Jetsons was a little cartoon. And, um, and these guys were actually also, uh, Singapore government was actually, they're kind of a corporate government. Um, and they were the first guys to uh, put money into our funds that were international. And uh, for that, I thank them. Um, Russia's kind of the opposite. Um, we've, we've had four false starts in Russia. Uh, or three false starts, and now we're trying for another one. Um, OK, okay the, the false starts were, OK, they committed $100 million to a Russian fund that we were going to run. And they were all set to go. And just before they wrote the check, um, and this was a, a group inside Russia that was well respected and whatever, um, just before I wrote the check, uh, Khodorkovsky got put into jail. And it turned out that that was all his money. And so it got frozen, and so that was, that was our first false start. Um, the second one, we, we created a new fund, and the fund, uh, and that was a s smaller fund, or, and um, the, the local team there 
was a group that the LP, the investor, chose. And we had to go with them. And they were all getting, they were investing a dollar and getting 10 cents back right away <laughs> from whoever they invested the dollar with. So I don't think it was a, a, a particularly good model. And, uh, and they, uh, but there were a few good companies that came out of that. And we were kind of thinking, gosh, I want to help this Russian group. So the last time I went um, to Russia, by the way, don't go in January. I walked outside, and the, all of the, every piece of heat left my body within three seconds <laughs> out the top of my head, and it was just gone. And I felt like I was in, just in a totally frozen body. Um, the, uh, so we started this uh, great, uh, this great fund, and... Uh, and I went to visit Russia, and I went to the Hermitage Museum. I went to St. Petersburg. Moscow's one thing. It's sort of like a big facade, and everything else is poor as dirt. But St. Petersburg is a spectacular city, and it is so gorgeous. And you can imagine that in 1800, that it was so cool and so amazing. Um, and I, I went into the Hermitage Museum, and, and they've got um, the greatest collection of Van Goghs and Renoirs and whatever in the world. This, this makes the Louvre look like podunk. And, but the, the floor's dirty, the walls are you know, graffiti. The whole place is a total mess. And what happened, I asked, I said, what happened here? They said, well, 75 years ago, the Bolsheviks came in and they, uh, and they were you know, mad at the wealthy Russians. And you know, this is happening in our country now. Um, they came in and they, and they made business illegal. And let this be a lesson to all of us. They made business illegal for 75 years. So imagine this, you're an entrepreneur. Your father believes business is bad, your grandfather believes business is bad, and his father also believes, believes business is bad and illegal. You have no role model. That is a horrible place to be. And, and if you have that entrepreneurial vibe, you don't even know how a, how a free market works. It is a scary place to be. Anyway, so, um, so I'm, uh, I'm hoping that if we keep at it long enough, a generation will go by where, um, where at least the father and mother will have understood the free market before these kids start businesses. But boy, there is some great technology coming out of Russia. Um, I met with the president of Ukraine, and, uh, and he again said, oh, we want you to invest in our country. And I said, I'd never invest in your country. And he said, what do you mean? We, we made it, he, he was very proud of himself because I was, he made it so I was the first person to set foot in Ukraine without a visa. They made it uh, so that uh, we, could, we could go to Ukraine freely without a visa, which is a great idea. Get rid of all those borders. <laughs> um, anyway, he, I said, I'd never invest in Ukraine, you know, doing the same sort of thing. And he goes, he goes why not, why not? And I said, well, it takes 23 bureaucrats and six months before you can even incorporate a company here. And he said, that will be one bureaucrat, one week. Now, it never really happened. Um, and he got sort of thrown out of office. But, <laughs> but he was quite, he was quite uh, revolutionary. He led the Orange Revolution. And the Orange Revolution was, um, was won by uh, text messaging. And, and he was able to say, uh, he, he was able to keep the pressure on the Capitol 24 seven by, um, by having people keep the supply chain going through instant messaging. And the supply chain was things like, get more flowers to the pretty girls in the front row so that they can, front line, so that they can put the flowers inside the guns that the guards are holding and get pizza to section A3, they're running low on food, and get beer over here, 
he needs more beer because he's he, he shouts much louder when he's got beer. <laughs> so, so they did it all with text messaging, and so it. Okay, I started to think, oh, interesting. Governments are going to change, and then Egypt and Tunisia fell because of Facebook and Twitter. We have this power, the social networking power. Geographic borders are going to fall. We are going to be, e it's going to be easier to move from country to country to country. And these guys who are sort of at the top, power hungry, whatever, are going to be overthrown. And the best governments are going to rise. And so we've got a new system now. It's competitive governance. The guy who was the king who said, you know, I, who, who basically was on the buy side, now has to turn around and he has to be on the sell side and say, come to my country. I want you in my country. And um, for entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists and money and corporations, they are, um, they are in great demand in countries all over the world. And hopefully, the US will follow suit and compete. Currently, they've been dropping. You know, they used to be, U.S. used to be number one, bar none, number one country to do business in. And now they're number four, and it seems to be dropping. Um, and this is one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get to see this. It's definitely worth looking at. OK, we have, we have what Dr. Seuss uh, Dr. Seuss created this great book. It's called, or it, I, I think it's inside one of the other books, but it's, it's the bee and the bee watcher. And see, the bee goes around and he works really hard. And then there's the bee watcher who, who wants to find out how that bee has been so productive. And so he sits and he watches the bee. And then he reports back, and they don't quite believe the bee watcher. And so they bring in the bee watcher watcher. And so the bee watcher watcher is watching the bee watcher watch the bee. And then it, then it gets, you know, of course, Dr. Seuss, it gets completely out of control. And there's the bee watcher watchering watch the bee watching watcher watcher watch. Um, but the whole idea there is we, we have the bees. We are the bees. And, um, and we don't need as many bee watchers. You have too many bee watchers, you start getting signals like that. Uh, and right now, our, our, the U.S. government has gone from 8% uh, where it was 8% 8, 8 overhead, which is, uh, you know, reasonable. One out of 12 people is a bee watcher, uh, to now it's 45% overhead. And overhead is, is defined. So it's like one bee watcher for every bee. Um, and, uh, and it's a little like... Um, it's a bad trend, and I think it's systemic, and we got a big problem. So uh, see what you can do about that, guys. Um, so here's, here's my slide on competitive governance. You've got, um, first, on the, f the lower right-hand corner, you've got all those great um, countries that are now going to be a part of Arab Spring, which was that, uh, the overthrow of Egypt and Tunisia. Those countries are coming next. Um, and then these are new countries. The one on the left down, lower left, is called Sea Land, and the one upper right is called Blue Seed. Sea Land is actually functioning as a country, not yet recognized as the, by the UN. And, and Blue Seed is going to be a country that's, that's a, a big boat 11 miles out off the shore of San Francisco, and they're going to bring all the programmers from all over the world to that location so that then, in effect, they get, they get sort of a, a visa or a, a green card. Uh, it's, it's a different kind of green card. Um, and then Bitcoin. Bitcoin is so cool. Who's heard of Bitcoin? Yeah, about a third. It's so cool. It's a new currency, and there's no government attached to it. It's the most valuable currency now on the planet because there, it, it is under no one's control. It is out of people's control. It is no longer regulated by any government. They can't, they can't print more Bitcoin. Uh, so this is actually um, very interesting. And there are a lot of interesting companies, CoinLab and uh, Coinbase, I guess, who have, who have started uh, businesses around Bitcoin. 
Now we're going to change um, the perspective of what I'm going to talk about. Um, we're going to be focusing here on change. This is Moore's law. It says that a thousand dollars worth of compute power doubles every 18 months. Now what that means to me is, and, and now it's accelerating, so it's like every 14 months. What that means to me is every 14 months, there's a new platform that's twice as powerful as the one before. And for you as entrepreneurs, you should be looking at that and going, yeah. So we can make everything more productive. We can make everything easier. We can improve everything through, uh, through just Moore's Law. Uh, in fact, if you, if you had, and I did, if you had an iPhone 3 and an iPhone 4 and a 4S and a 5, you would feel and realize that each one was twice as powerful as the one before. The iPhone 5 is unbelievably powerful. And the 6 will be even more powerful. The, this doubling is creating huge opportunities. So the things I could do on the iPhone 3 are nothing compared to what I can do on the iPhone 5. This is another chart that, you know, start thinking about the future. This is, you know, a politician would never, never quote anything from this. Energy is falling in, in, in price at an extraordinary rate. So it's from 78 to today, energy has gone from $5 a kilowatt hour to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And it continues to fall. And, um, and this is really interesting because as that happens, you should be starting to think about businesses that actually use a lot of energy. Um, change is happening faster and faster. We all know that. But as an entrepreneur, I want you to look at it this way. Last 150 years, what have we had in the last 150 years? What, what's happened over the last 150 years that have changed our lives? Um, the light bulb, indoor plumbing, radio, automotive, television, airplanes, the pill, the bomb, microwave, semiconductor, satellites, photocopier, space travel, computers, email, fiber optics, biotech, cell phones, x-rays, internet, digital cameras, web browsers, search engines, smartphones. Now, with that acceleration, with that Moore's law, that same amount of change, human change, is going to happen over the next 15 years. So imagine what could possibly happen over the next 15 years. We could have uh, a near infinite energy supply, uh, desalinated water, water that, that's easy flowing, self-navigating electric cars. Maybe they'll fly. Um, interactive education. We, you won't have to sit in these chairs. You can be much more comfortable. You can just watch me on some little screen. You know, it's. Of course, then you can't give me quite as hard a time. Um, design genomics or cures for cancer, AIDS, malaria. Um, Non-invasive surgery. You know that the, I, this makes me think of non-invasive uh, security. Um, when you go through those metal detectors, you know, at the airport? Well, um, I, we invested in a company that has, has changed all that. And when you go through those things that look like metal detectors, they're seeing you behind the little screen. They're seeing you completely naked. And when we invested in that company, we thought, wow, there are a lot of applications for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, near thought communications. Yeah. OK, I don't think it's really working. <laughs> um, but it will. And, uh, and food drop. I thought. I, when I was a kid, I'd run around, and I never really wanted to stop because there's so much to explore and there's so much to do. And I always felt like getting food was always such a hassle. So I always felt like you should get something that said, food, drop. And the food would drop into your hands. We're getting there. You know, you, if you combine like Uber cab with pizza delivery with, um, oh, I have, OK, we'll get to the next slide. And I have another really fun thing. It's um, two years after that, we're going to have even more change. So um, 
as an entrepreneur, you better be imagining things that are way out there. Otherwise, uh, it's probably not going to happen. So need anticipation. Here's what I'm guessing. You know these body bugs? Have you guys seen the body bugs and the Fitbits and the whole works? Yeah. OK. So, so those, those are determining things like you know, what's your blood gluco glucose level. So you could have those. And they could immediately alert some food delivery guy <laughs> that, your, that your blood sugar level is low, and you need more potassium, and you need more calcium. And so milk, a banana, and a pizza show up. And you can just keep going. Um, and then, of course, Star Trek with a transporter. We're, we're almost transporting now. Have you noticed that? I, I can feel like I'm in an entirely no, another place by using Skype or video conference or whatever. Um, we're going to have, uh, I think, in, in, uh, in medicine, we're going to have human rebalancing. I think people are going to, um, this is my uh, friend Cree Edwards has a theory on, on that we're all energy sources and uses. And I think you could be rebalanced. And so uh, when things aren't quite right with you, you just rebalance. And I guess that's what meditation's about. But you can kind of go beyond that. And then um, Martian colonies, Elon Musk is trying to get us to Mars, right? And then this is my favorite of all time, <laughs> human-animal communications. Um, you know why this is really cool? I started, I've been listening to birds for some reason. And, um, and they go, tweet, 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 tweet. What if you took each tweet and thought of that as a bird sentence? And you take them apart. And, and you guys, there was some electrical engineering here, right? There's, take that apart and look at it as a signal to noise ratio and figure out what signals those birds are sending when somebody comes in or when they're all flying in harmony or whatever else. So, uh, so that, I think that's a fun thing to think about. Um, this is how fast viral marketing has exploded. But I, want, I, wanted, I brought up this chart um, because this was how fast uh, Hotmail grew. And that was the biggest, the fastest growing consumer product in the history of the world. And then Skype was much faster. Hmm, interesting. Things are spreading faster around the world. OK, we have a new company, OK? It's called Bang with Friends. <laughs> and it, it is exploding. It is at a half a million users in a week. <laughs> Viral marketing is amazing. It's amazing what you can do. So I want you to put on good marketing hats here. Um, this is crowdsourcing, and, and I want to talk just really about, everybody knows about Kickstarter and Uber and Pinterest and Box and TaskRabbit. But down here, this is the coolest thing. One of these entrepreneurs I funded came up with a uh, watch, and the watch had email on it. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. You can have email on your watch. And the guy is great. And I thought, well, you know, I really, you know, it's hardware, but I think I'll take a chance on this guy. So I gave him a little money. And then it looked like, in many cases, we do lose everything. Um, and it looked like we lost everything. And, he, you know, he was sort of coming back for money and didn't quite know exactly what. And then he put the thing, he said, well, let's do a video for Kickstarter. Why not? Sort of a, it was like a Hail Mary pass. And he did this video for Kickstarter. And they got $10 million <laughs> from Kickstarter. And $5 million of that was pre-orders for his watch. And the other $5 million was just money. <laughs> they just liked the video. That is so incredibly powerful. So uh, watch for crowdsourcing and funding. Now, I like to think, well, what happens next? And what's happening with viral marketing, with things spreading, with crowdsourcing, is that distribution is becoming a commodity. And the reason I know is I was watching TV, and I was trying to do a pay-per-view. And they said, pay-per-view, which service would you like to use? Amazon, Netflix, da 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 da, -da. There, were, there were six or seven of these things. 
And I thought, whoa, distribution is commoditizing. Those guys are all competing to send me my pay-per-view. So if, if the distribution's commoditizing, then technological breakthroughs are gonna spread around the world faster than they ever did before. So what that means to you as potential entrepreneurs is you better be thinking not just a couple years ahead or the next step. You better be thinking the next step and then what's the next step beyond that and then what's the crazy step beyond that. If you're in the crazy step area, you've got a good shot at success. If you're in the next step area, you will not, well, it will be very difficult for you to succeed. So, so when you go through this process, you better step back and you better think, before I dive in here, it, it has to be more than good idea. It has to be good idea that will take advantage of the, the trend that may be happening, not even now, but three or four years from now. Because otherwise, you're competing with big, huge companies that have many more resources than you do. <laughs> Venture capital is changing. So um, because of this, I have to change my own business. I have to figure out what to do. I don't know what to do. It's not going to be the same as it was before. We got crowdsourcing and we got I mean, crowdfunding and we've got uh, angels and we've got incubators and it's a whole different game than it used to be. So I have to start thinking, what's not what's next, but what's next after next after next. Um, here's what I look for for an entrepreneur. I'm looking for somebody who breaks down walls. Uh, these companies like the post office was broken. All these things I thought would be here forever. I thought the post office, Ma Bell, trade, the neighborhood would all be exactly the way they are they were when I was growing up. I didn't think things changed. And then all of a sudden, Hotmail mail blew out the post office. You don't have to write letters and lick the stamps. And uh, you guys probably haven't even done that in your lives. And don't, because it's like poison. <laughs> um, telecom business got turned on its ear because of Skype. Trade, uh, all trade has changed because of eBay. The neighborhood has changed because of Facebook. I asked my son when he was about 12 years old, I said, why don't you go out there and play with your friends? And he goes, I am dad. And he was sitting there looking at his Facebook page. Um, and then research, advertising, libraries, whatever. Um, Google has just kind of blown all those things out. So when you go after something, make sure you go after something very big uh, as an iconoclast. Go after something big. So I'll give you a few examples of things you might want to go after. Um, venture capital. <laughs> Um, investment banking, it, wherever there's sort of an, a monopoly, go after that, go blow it up. Uh, medicine, medicine, there are like, I don't know, 10 big drug companies and they control all the drugs all throughout the world, except for the ones that you've been trading. Um, <laughs> he had his head down so he doesn't know I pointed at him. Um, and, uh, and, and so look, look at areas where there's a big monopoly and see if you can blow it up. Um, government. Government is one big, frothy, sloppy, oozing monopoly. <laughs> and it needs to be cut and better, more efficient, and people need to go out there and become part of the free market and not just sit there and go, uh, I'm sorry, I don't like the, the color of your curtains, which is what they do to me when I'm building a new school. Um, clever business models. Look for zeros in your business model. Um, Amazon figured out how to get a zero accounts receivable and zero inventory. They had the biggest bookstore in the world and never held a book. That was huge. That changed the whole nature of a balance sheet and an income statement. Look for these, I look for these things. I look for these crazy, whoa, where did that come from? The black swan. So those are the three things I look for. Um, and disruptions, we funded some very interesting things, but the one I'll point out is SpaceX because SpaceX did take on the government. They 
NASA, to launch a certain payload into space, it costs $300 million in real dollars and $3 billion, including all the overhead. Uh, SpaceX was able to do that for $30 million, so one one-hundredth of what it was costing NASA. So NASA then subbed out and said, oh, this makes a lot of sense, let's just go with SpaceX. Yeah, yeah cool, huh? <laughs> Um, now I'm going to tell you about Draper University of Heroes because it's, um, it's really fun and we actually have a few people who went in the audience. Um, I thought, there's something wrong in education and I didn't quite know what. And I looked and I said, you know, it's the A. The A means don't make any mistakes. I think the world needs more mistakes. I think penicillin was a mistake. Velcro was a mistake. Uh, uh, Facebook was a mistake. These were all mistakes. These were the extraordinary thing happening because people were willing to fail. They were willing to try and fail. So I don't recommend necessarily going out there and just failing all your classes. But I, I do want you to, when you read this stuff, when you do it, think and then try stuff. So at Draper University, we decided we were going to be all feel. Very little thinking goes on at Draper University. It's all feel. So you do things. We, we do lots and lots of things. It's a little bit business school, a little bit engineering, not much, and, um, and a lot of fun. So, uh, and, and we graduate everybody with a degree of change agent, uh, and, and the way we get them thinking change, it's, it, you live there, and the way we get them thinking change is, uh, from day one when we play volleyball, uh, I, I say, okay, we're gonna all play volleyball, and then I give a ball to each team, and I say, okay, serve, and they, so both balls are in the air at the same time, and so then I say, if some team wins three, points in a row, you can start a new rule that everybody has to follow. So they're hopping on one foot, speaking in Spanish, you know, they're doing it left-handed, whatever. And, uh, and it gets people's imaginations going. So we change the rules of monopoly, the rules of risk, we, nuclear risk. We, uh, we change the uh, rules of baseball. Can you imagine an American being willing to change the rules of baseball? Anyway, we gave it a shot. And, um, and then we have, you know, they learn cooking and, and riflery and uh, yoga and painting and, Audrey, what else did you learn? Go-karting. Go-karting, karaoke. Oh, she has a voice. It is unbelievable. Gorgeous voice. Um, maybe we'll get you up here to sing with me. You want to do that? Yeah. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, it's great fun. It's eight weeks. You can take a quarter off from Stanford. Tina will give you eight units <laughs> of A. And, um, and you can come and you'll, and we have survival training, both urban and rural. And, uh, and we don't, I don't like to tell you too much about the survival training because there are some interesting surprises you'll run into. And, uh, and then we teach things like viral marketing rather than marketing 101. And we teach finance as a simulation. So, and, and the people who come and teach are, uh, are people who have done great things in the past. So uh, Tony Shea of Zappos came in and spoke on corporate culture and uh, Cree Edwards spoke on energy and uh, uh, we, Elon Musk spoke on we asked, one of the students asked, Elon, so, so what, what one piece of advice would you give to an entrepreneur? And he said, don't do it. Because, <laughs> you know, the guy's got two companies and he's in the center of all that activity. And anyway, I thought that was a great answer because it sends you a message that if you are <laughs> going to be an entrepreneur, it has to come from here. It has to come from your heart, your lungs, your feet. It, it can't come from your brain. Um, so we've, uh, it's great fun, and, um, and I, how are we on time? Nine minutes. 
Nine minutes, does that include my Q&A? Oh, it does. OK, so I won't go into what that looks like. But um, remember, wherever you go, whatever you do, entrepreneurs are heroes. They take long odds at extraordinary outcomes. They, do, they change the world in ways that make our lives so much easier, so much better. And uh, they'll help us rebuild the economy, make our lives better. And so if you are an entrepreneur, you are my hero. And if you want to support an entrepreneur, I would recommend it very highly. Um, and since entrepreneurs are really my hero, what do you do for your hero? You sing to them. Hit it. There we go. <laughs> okay, Lord, 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 you can sing along because I'm really not a good singer. Invested all his mattress money. Horses are on the way in town. Scraping up his alimony. Friends think he's a little funny. Needs a world class CEO. Just another million or so. <laughs> Get into some real cash flow. Tears and sweat, and I be hope. For 15 years, he's been out there. Bankers demanding blood refund. Companies looking more fun. Even great. Will not fund. Ambition got into a mission. Fearless and free employee. No guarantee for the corporate escapee. Team fights on against the trend. Had to lay off his best friend. Call the recession. Seems like depression. Chapter 7. Is this the end? <laughs> then a salesman shouts, We got it! The company's gonna show them right. To think the papers ran quick side. The sky is open. Oh, yeah.